Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be with you all today and uh, truly an honor to be speaking in front of this crowd. I, it's a bit unusual, but uh, frankly, uh, you know, with the pace that the technology is moving forward, it's really the uh, innovators and the young minds, which many of you are sitting in the audience today, are really going to shape the future. So as I was asked to come and give you a talk today, I thought, okay, so, you know, what is it that I think would be interesting for folks? You know, everybody has held up Intel, you guys are living in, you know, Silicon Valley where, you know, the technology is sort of in our, in our lifeblood here. But, you know, I thought maybe I'd start with sharing my experience. Uh, I came to America uh, about 30 years ago and I was pretty much, you know, exactly in the same shoes of many of the high school students here. I was a sophomore. And when I came here, I didn't, barely could speak English. I, you know, uh, my handwriting was terrible and, you know, I was put into a high school and, you know, I was like, okay, so I really want to do well. I want to be, I was passionate. I wanted to, you know, I was given this amazing opportunity to be here in America and I didn't want to, you know, screw up. So, you know, I started thinking, okay, so how am I going to impress my teachers? How am I going to make sure that, you know, as I'm, you know, going through my schooling, uh, you know, I'm going to be neat, I'm going to be organized. So at the time, you know, as I was getting my lab experiments and my, you know, physics assignments for, okay, writing up, okay, your lab reports, I turned to the typewriter. I said, okay, this is going to help me to essentially, you know, write my stories, write my assignments, be neat, the teacher understands this, they, they're not, you know, what kind of a language this is. And, you know, I went through, you know, I got through the high school and, you know, as I was applying to colleges, you know, I, I learned, look, at the time, the computers were coming out. Personal computer at that time, we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, early, you know, 80s time frame. And these personal computers were coming out. They were expensive. They were big. You had to go to them. You know, and certainly I could not afford it. You know, just a kid just coming here, you know, go, going through, you know, sort of a very tight budget. So I hop onto the train and I go all the way to, you know, Center City, you know, Philadelphia in order to basically use these, these computers. You know, this was a college there and I sneak into the lab and I use it and I was like, great, you know, now I'm writing my essays to the universities and I'm being, you know, neat and maybe that puts me a little bit ahead of everybody else. So then, you know, I got through my schooling and I went through college and after, you know, working in three or four years in the automotive industry, then you know, I joined this company called Intel. And as I joined Intel, what happened was, you know, shocking to me. It was, you know, I, I came into this company and I learned something that was pretty phenomenal. And this was um, a, essentially, I would say, pace of technology that was set by one of the founders named, you know, Gordon Moore, and it was called Moore's Law. Back in the mid-60s, Gordon Moore essentially, you know, took his, you know, log graph, you know, back of the napkin, sort of, hey, you know, he predicted that the number of transistors or the number of elements on a chip is essentially going to keep doubling every couple of years. That was sort of his prediction. And he started, you know, the, the histories, he started drawing that on a on a graph paper, and eventually, you know, the, the graph sort of, you know, ran off space. And then he turned to a log paper, and those of you, you know, mathematician in the, in the room know that, you know, with a straight line, you know, on a log paper, he essentially predicted this Moore's law. And ever since then, ever since almost, you know, 50 years ago, this industry, which we call semiconductor industry, has stayed on this path of the Moore's Law. And if you look back in the 1971 time frame, you know, a early, you know, logic, you know, this is, this is the microprocessor, only had a couple thousand, you know, transistors on it. And now, you know, just in 2000, you know, 14, this is, you know, many of you going out there to your favorite stores and you're buying your computers, you know, you hear about, you know, the i7 processors, Pentium processors, etc. They all have, you know, nearly, you know, 
for over 4 billion transistors now. Okay? And you know, you look at the pace of that you know, improvement since you know, 1970 or since Gordon Moore sort of predicted, and this you know, industry has sort of stayed on that pace, that's one point, almost two million times increase in the, in the rate of pace. So it's phenomenal. And, and you sort of think about, okay, so you know, you're essentially putting these transistors, right? And you're putting them on these chips, and you're talking about very, very small dimensions. And those of you sort of, you are in the valley and you hear about these technologies, like, you know, we are at, you know, 32 nanometer, and now we sort of break the barriers at 22 nanometers, and this product, Ivy Bridge, I'm talking about, that was a 22 nanometer, and now we're hearing, wow, you know, we just heard this announcement, 14 nanometer technology coming out. Well, that's the piece of technology that we're talking about. The whole industry, it doesn't matter, it's Intel or, you know, your, your other big corporations working on these technologies, that's the pace everybody's moving on. So when you're talking about nanometer, what are we talking about? So, all I can tell you is very, very small dimensions, right? If you take a cross-section of your hair, just one stand of your hair, right? And think a lot more smaller. We're talking about 100,000 times smaller than the diameter of your hair. That's one nanometer. In fact, you know, I have an arrow there. Those are looking at the slider. You can't even see it. So, we're talking about, you know, if you look on the your right hand side there, you see that we're talking about molecular level, right? And, you know, since just 20, 30 years ago, which is a split second, right? If you look at overall history of, you know, the modern day revolution, industrial revolution, this is where we have become. And, you know, I will propose to you that we have not even started. We are actually, this pace will not only continue, but it will accelerate. And what you have seen over the last you know, several years, in fact, that acceleration is increasing because of the exponential aspect of what we are talking about here. And Moore's law is not just a science experiment. It's not just, hey, you know, let's just keep getting it smaller and smaller and smaller and you know, do whatever it takes to get there. There is economics associated with that. This is how business thrives on. Many, many businesses are thriving at it. And beyond the businesses, it's making a difference in people's lives. It is bringing on all kinds of new usage models that were not possible before, right? So let me, let me give you a you know, couple of examples. First, you know, if, if you look back, you know, again, back in the history, it took like a forklift to you know, carry a, a hard drive you know, into an airplane to carry it around, right? For many of you, right, this is way before your time, that's not even imaginable. You, you put a terabyte in your pocket and you move it around, right? And when you're thinking about the possibilities of what Moore's Law has done, right, it's, it's creating all these new usage models where people are loading up 300 million pictures or images per day onto Facebook, right? If you needed something like that, well, you think that's possible. No way. So these are examples of what Moore's Law is doing. Now, many of you are carrying your you know, computing devices with you. You know, new advent of all kinds of usage models. Now, all those data gets, gets in, incorporated into the servers and the analytics that are associated with those. These are all new usage models that are coming out. But one of the things that's quite interesting, and many of you will say, well, and 20 years ago people thought that, hey, this Moore's Law is going to come to an end. You're talking about molecular level. You're talking about, you know, you know at some point, you know, this, this laws of physics are going to take over and you're done. Well, people thought that 20 years ago, you're done with Moore's Law. Many scientists from all very reputable research institutions, they said, Moore's Law is an end, done, you're finished, okay? But guess what? The human innovation keeps pushing this phenomenon forward. So Moore's Law is 
not just the economics. It's not just, hey, let's just keep doing a science experiment. It's a commitment. It's a, essentially a responsibility that the entire technology industry they are standing behind, whether it's the end user, whether it's a software person, whether it's the person running the server, and whether it's the person making the chip, they are all pushing on this commitment all together. And that's how the world is moving forward. So this concept of doubling the number of chips every two years, right? It keeps going and going and going. Now, another, if, if, if you're giving examples, and many of you can refer to that in your sort of everyday life of the electronics. But if we were to apply, if we were to apply Moore's law to a automotive industry, right? Just the pace of technology advancement, right? A car that used to go 81 miles per hour would now be going almost 650,000 miles per hour. A car that was 26 miles per hour per gallon would now be taking on, they can go 260,000 miles per gallon. And lastly, a car that used to cost $2,500 would now be costing 25 cents. Actually, two cents, three cents. <laughs> so, so think about it. The pace of technology is amazing. It is moving forward and you see all around it. And you are all in the center of it, right here in Silicon Valley. And the people that actually created this whole phenomenon from nothing were right here you know, within the you know, 10 mile block of where we are right now. So, the key message is technology will continue to disrupt the traditional business models. It will continue, right? And, and the need for innovation never stops, right? There's always problems, and you saw many examples today. And whether it's in medicine, whether it's transportation, where, where you know, th there are traditional models of people you know, calling up a taxi, and now a new model that comes up that says, you know, hey, there are new usage models that sort of disrupt that, right? Or environmental, all kinds of problems that are out there with you know, more usage of power and, and how the world is needing more power consumption and the, you know, the green gas emissions, as well as, you know, more importantly, you know, really in, in solving and curing diseases that are still plaguing many, many people around the world. So technology is not just about you know, getting people you know, handheld devices in their hand. It is bringing on efficiency, it's bringing on better ways of life, and it is enriching people's lives all around the world. So the key here is, you know, and I will you know, uh, motivate and I will ask you to take on any area that you have a passion about and go drive it. And those people around you that you see that have made a huge impact in the world, they have changed the world. And if I look around them and I say, what are some of the key traits that these folks have that made them to be where they are and how they impacted the world? There are a few things. And you can do that too. The first thing the most important trait that these folks have, they think differently, okay? They don't just go after some incremental improvement. Let's just make this five or 10% improvement. They ask the question, why can it be done this way? Why is it being done this way? So thinking differently, thinking of all those possibility questions. What if, how, why not? The second thing is learn from your mistakes, right? If, if you're afraid of failure, you're not going to get there. And in fact, many of you know about the famous, you know, quote with, the, with the Edison, right? Edison's assistant says, hey, you know, let's give this up. We have tried this thousands of ways, all these new elements that are not working. What the heck are we are wasting our time for? And what was Edison's response? He said, we now know more than a thousand ways that a light bulb doesn't work. <laughs> so let's keep going. Having a passion to win, okay? There's a big difference between being in first and second place. You know, never accepting, hey, this 
let's, let's, let's do something subpar. Having that passion, having that personal responsibility that I want to go drive something because I believe in it, right? Despite many naysayers, many noises out there that says, no, 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 it won't work. If you believe in it, go drive it. But be open and listen. And lastly, do what it takes. You know, it's not about how hard you work, or it's not about, you know, oh, you know the, it's all the reasons of why it can't be done. Just go do it. Just do what it takes. If I were to leave you with one thing, and my favorite quote goes back from, you know, Intel founder, Robert Noyce, who was the visionary, really set this sort of industry off the ground, the semiconductor industry. And he said, don't be encumbered by history. Go off and do something wonderful. Thank you.